How's it going, everybody? This is Mr. Jackson here. Today we are talking about the rise of European totalitarianism, specifically focusing about the Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, and fascist Italy. So what is totalitarianism? Well, the Oxford Dictionary defines it as relating to a system of government that is centralized and dictatorial and requires complete subservience to the state, meaning submission. Now, there's some common characteristics that all totalitarian states share. One of them is they have a dynamic leader. Now, the people usually rally behind this leader. There's one party rule. Now, this party outlaws all parties once they become in power. After Wadia's first free elections, President Prime Minister Admiral General Aladdin won 98.8% of the vote. And there's an ideology of submission to the state, meaning everything should be completely about the state, not the individual. Uh, and there's a control of all individual lives. This is so that everything revolves around the party. These totalitarian states also control all aspects of society, education, uh, economics, politics, culture, media, all everything. Now, the state uses sophisticated methods of enforcement, okay? Uh, military force, secret police. When we start studying Italy, they use black shirts, which are thugs that go around beating up people. Nazi Germany used brown shirts, which are the same thing, but just wearing brown shirts. And finally, they use technology to solidify control. They use media, they use radio, they use TV. Now, finally, and most importantly, there's a lot of waving statues in the totalitarian states. And now it's important to know that the citizens living in the three main European totalitarian states, Italy, Germany, Russia, they have been ruled for the majority of their history by some type of king. Uh, Russia had the Tsar, Germany had the Kaiser, Italy had a king. They did not have experience uh, ruling themselves through democracy like we had. Talk to me about democracy. Masses can't lead themselves. In the old days, one man decided what was best for the country and there was order and discipline. Now everyone votes on everything and the result is chaos. I assure you, Barry, it works in America. There they have states with governors under a president in Washington. Here we have the Prussian state, the Bavarian state, and so forth under a president in Berlin. The structure is essentially the same. It's not the same thing, Anston. You know it. Germans need to be led. Second, these citizens also wanted simple answers for complex problems. Econo economic security, political instability, and famine. Last week we studied about inflation in Germany. Those, that was one major problem. Do you know how much it costs for a loaf of bread these days? 500,000 marks. 500,000 marks. The wheelbarrows aren't big enough to carry the money in. Now, there's a quote by Benjamin Franklin that perfectly summarizes what happens to the Italian, German, and Russian people. And he says, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little, a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty or safety. Now, the first totalitarian state we're going to talk about is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, better known as the USSR. Now, before we start talking about the rise of the US, USSR, it's important that we define three key terms. They are capitalism, socialism, and communism. And I place them on this line to help you better understand them. On the far left, we have capitalism. Right next to it, we have socialism. And to the far right, we have communism. Now, capitalism is an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than the state. And the state meaning government. The United States lives under a form of capitalism. Now, next to it, right on the, on the right, is socialism. Now, socialism is an economic theory of social organization that believes that the means of production, meaning the businesses, should be owned by the government. However, 
workers earn wages and can own personal property. So they work for a company which is controlled by the government and they get paid and they own their own houses, their own cars, clothes, stuff like that, but the government doesn't own it. Now at this point in history, there are some countries that have installed socialist policies, uh, but they, it wasn't fully implemented, meaning that the government owns certain industries, okay, but a large number of industries were owned by individuals. And finally, on the far right, we have communism, which is a stateless, classless society governed directly by the people. Private property is abolished and replaced with common ownership. The means of production are also commonly owned. People still work, but they do not receive any pay or money for their services. They just take what they need and give the rest away. Since no one receives money for their work, there's no rich or poor people. Everyone is the same. How much does this thing cost? The economics of the future are somewhat different. You see, money doesn't exist in the 24th century. No money? You mean you don't get paid? The acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity. Now, it's a really important to stress that this type of society has never been achieved. Now, some small societies have tried implementing some type of communistic society going all the way back to early colonial America. For example, at the beginning of the Plymouth Colony, uh, property was communally owned and farmed. Each person placed their crops in a common storehouse at the end of harvest season. The women and children all worked together performing various uh, community chores. The Plymouth col col colonists did not receive any money for their crops or the chores that they performed. However, there's still a little bit of a class system. Ultimately, communism in the Plymouth colony failed because it created confusion and discontent. The most able men thought it was an, an injustice that they were given the same portions of food and other vital materials that those who could not perform a quarter of the same work did. It's not that I'm lazy. It's that I just don't care. Don't, don't care? It's a problem of motivation, all right? Now, if I work <laughs> and it takes ships a few extra units, I don't see another dime. So where's the motivation? Women viewed the communal chores that they were forced to perform for others as a type of slavery. Basically, what I'm trying to say that the I the idea of a communistic society has been around forever. However, there's no way of achieving it at that point of time. Now, there's a lot of reasons for this, but the main one is that it's extremely hard to convince people to give up their money to somebody else. Second, it took a lot of time and manpower to build stuff. And it, the more time you spend working on something, the more expensive that item is going to be. Now, this all changes during the Industrial Revolution, when products are being made cheaper and more quickly. During the same time, a man named Karl Marx appears. He was a German philosopher living during the Industrial Revolution, meaning he just published his thoughts on various subjects. He disapproved of capitalism and wanted a communistic society. And he became famous because he was like one of those crazy street preachers you see predicting the end of the world. Now, Marx predicted this worldwide revolution would take place, okay, where the working class people who he called the proletariat that he believed were being exploited would rise up and forcefully, through revolution, overthrow the upper class or factory owners whom he called the bourgeoisie.
this revolution would also end all nations in the world. And everybody would be just one big body of people. Now, after the revolution, all the wealth that was being held by the bourgeoisie would be redistributed to the proletariat or the working class. Now, after the revolution, there'd be a temporary period where society would be extremely socialistic. Then slowly over time, and eventually a perfect communist society would develop. In this society, there's no class system. There's no rich or poor. There's no money. There's no individual nations like the United States, Germany, France, Mexico. And all the work would be done by these machines so that people had all this extra time to do whatever they want. Marxist philosophy became very popular and it gained a lot of followers. Okay, and these followers were called Marxists. These followers tried to fulfill Marx's destiny by starting a global revolution. However, they needed a specific event that could kickstart this global revolution. Now, the followers of Marx believed that the event that would kickstart this global revolution was the Russian Revolution. It started in 1917 with the overthrow of the Russian Tsar in the capital of Imperial Russia, Petrograd. The people revolted because Russia's involvement in World War I took a lot of Russian lives and it resulted in a large famine that swept through the country and was devastating the people. A provisional government is established, meaning a temporary government, and is made up by elected members that the Russian people elected to it. This new government is controlled by two groups. One of them is the Petrograd Soviets, which are which is the radical left, the Marxists, the people who wanted social, socialism, but not full-on communism. They were all grouped together. And the other uh, group is called the Provisional Gov Government, and that's everybody else, the conservatives, uh, the, the moderates, and the slightly liberal people. Now, the Russian Revolution started because of two main things. One of them was World War I. They were tired of being in that war. And two was that the Russian peasantry did not own their own land. The provisional government promised to do these things, but they kept Russia in the war even after they overthrew the Tsar, and they failed to give land to the peasants. During this time, a new political faction called the Bolsheviks rise of popularity within the Petrograd Soviets. The majority of these uh, followers were Marxists, okay? And they wanted to not only uh, spread uh, communism to throughout Russia, but they also wanted to spread it into an entire world. Now, the Bolsheviks will be eventually called the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and it's led by a man named Vladimir Lenin. Lenin's motto was peace, bread, and land, okay? Peace meaning a promise to get Russia out of the war, bread, a promise to end the famine that was started because of World War I, land was a promise to give land to the peasants. What Lenin was doing was saying, hey, if you vote for me or join the Bolshevik party, I'm going to give you all this free stuff, basically money. Just. And now, folks. It's time for who do you trust? Hubba, hubba, hubba. Money, money, money. Who do you trust? Me? I'm giving away free money. Later that October, Lenin and his Bolsheviks overthrow the provisional government and take control. Lenin establishes an extremely socialist government with the purpose of spreading communism, not just throughout Russia, but the entire world. However, Lenin's Russia isn't fully communist. The, the Russian peasants do get to own their own farmland, so there is a little bit of private property. He's in the devouring fall of Marx, so he wants to fulfill Marx's prophecy of a worldwide revolution that would lead to a classist society. However, while he's in power, there's a massive civil war, okay, between the Reds, the people who are the socialists and the Soviets, and the Whites, which is everybody else who doesn't want to have socialism. And that takes up the majority of his time and money, and he can't fulfill that process. And eventually, Lenin dies, and there's a big struggle over who's going to be the next leader of the Communist Party, which controlled Russia. So basically, they were deciding who was going to be the leader of of the entire nation of Russia, which it ultimately came down to two people, Lenin Trotsky and Joseph Stalin. Trotsky was Lenin's right-hand man and a devout Marxist. However, Stalin held a powerful position within the communist government, but not as powerful as Trotsky. 
Furthermore, Stalin wasn't a diehard Marxist like Lenin and Trotsky was. However, he was ruthless and eventually takes over. Stalin in Russia means man of steel, and Stalin was cold as steel. He was the complete opposite of Lenin. Lenin uh, was violent and did a lot of terrible things, but he did those things as a means to an end. Stalin loved killing people. Uh, he had bullets on his uh, desk. He loved wearing military uniforms. He was ruthless. One to make the argument that he was just as bad or even worse than Hitler. Now, while Stalin was in power from 1927 through uh, 53, there's varying estimates, but anywhere from 20 to 60 million people died of unnatural causes not related to World War II. Um, 20 million died in the fighting in the war. 34 million people were forcibly relocated against their will or sent to the gulags, which were Russian forced labor prison camps in the middle of Siberia or some really, really cold, isolated area where they were never seen again. Just to give you an idea of how terrible and ruthless Stalin was, during the Battle of Stalingrad, when Russian civilians were starving, a German army was cut off and even more starving, German soldiers would give Russian children little bits of bread to go down to the, uh, a river and fill up their canteen and bring it back to this uh, German soldier. Stalin ordered Russian snipers to shoot those children. That's how ruthless Stalin was. Not only was Stalin ruthless, he's also extremely paranoid, and he committed what was called the Great Purge. During this purge, he used his secret police force called the NKVD, which later became the KGB, to purge on a large, massive scale the, the Communist Party, wealthy uh, peasants, um, military leaders, anybody who opposed him. And during this time, he killed 16 out of his 19 top generals. The purge of his generals would have a tremendous effect later on in the war when they're fighting the Germans. This purge just terrified the Russian people. And after it, people started showing their uh, affection and loyalty to Stalin in outrageous ways, just so they wouldn't get killed. One more question, no. please. Tell it to the boss. He likes good hunting stories. Him with pride because he's looking at you. Stalin realized that Russia was decades behind uh, other European powers in America in terms of industrialization, okay? And he wanted to change that. And in order to do that, he created his five year plans. These five-year plans were a way of planning growth over long periods of time through the use of quotas that they would um, have to meet each year. And in order to do this, Stalin relocated millions of people in, from the uh, rural areas into the cities to work in these factories. All right, and there are three five-year plans, okay, each focusing on certain things. The first two were heavy industry and, uh, and collectivized farming. And the third was uh, military weapons. These were extremely successful. Um, in certain areas, uh, total output increased by over 300%. The total industrial output of Russia increased 118%. However, I want to be clear, the quality of these products Furthermore, these were things that the average Russian people couldn't use, like shoes, cars. These were oil production, steel, electricity, coal, and military stuff. So the average Russian person didn't benefit from it. In order to feed these massive population of workers in the, in the factories, uh, farming had become way more productive in Russia. And in order to do this, Stalin started collectivizing farms. Now, collectivization of farms is a policy of forced consolidation or grouping of individual peasant households or farms. Forming large government-run farms called kolkhozes. These uh, farmers uh, who were forced to work these farms were the same people that Lenin gave the farms to uh, earlier. So they were given land and then they immediately had this land seeds and they were forced to work on these lands for nothing. In fact, the farmers were not allowed to eat the food from the land until they had met these quotas. And these laws were enforced 
ruthlessly, ruthlessly, especially in the nation of Ukraine, where seven to eight million uh, Ukrainians were for, uh, starved to death by a forced famine ordered by Stalin because Ukrainian farmers refused to work on collective farms. The Ukrainian peasants didn't want to have anything to do with collectivization and fought it. And they fought it much harder than anyone else did. And there were outright battles. I mean, we're talking hundreds of uprisings in 1929-1930, where Ukrainian peasants, you know, essentially said, we're not going to have anything to do with your collective farms. Stalin sought through the famine to impose his control on Ukraine. Without Ukraine, there is no USSR. Uh, Ukraine was known as the breadbasket of Europe because it was the center of grain production originally in the Russian Empire, um, but also within Europe itself. Um, most of Russia's grain export came from the black earth lands of Ukraine. Teams of people came into Ukraine and went village by village and removed the food from people's houses. Apples, beets, uh, uh, they would lead away the cows, they would take away whatever was in storage. І забрали все, що ми мали тільки, навіть таку мали землянку, і там вибрали все, що мали. І тоді голодом морили, бо хотіли, щоб йшли до колгоспу люди робити. Даже мама борщі зварила, і той витягли із печі і з'їли. Ці, як то кейджебі, пенкаведисти. Нас мама тримає Андрія. А я маму за спідницю, і нас викинули на дорогу, отак у сніг, і замкнули хату. Тата вже нема, повезли тата. Журналіст Гарріт Джонс рискнув his life to travel to Ukraine and report on the famine. There he interviewed survivors and Soviet agents. If any man, woman, or child goes out into the field at night in the summer, and picks a single ear of wheat, then the punishment according to law is death by shooting, the communists explained to me. Jones described what was known as the Law of the Five Ears of Wheat, signed by Mikhail Kalinin, head of the USSR Central Executive Committee, and Vyacheslav Molotov, head of the Council of People's Commissars, used judicial repressions of the highest degree as measures of social protection against theft of collective farm property, execution by shooting, and confiscation of all property. They passed passport laws that forbade Ukrainians to go, peasantry to go into the cities, um, and eventually they blocked the entire republic, so people couldn't leave. А як іде, що ще вже і є перепеленята, але що вони не розстоять, і то так їла. А так як ішов, на дорозі впав, а люди так падали, як муха. Ще людина дихала, вони забирали, каже, бо ми не приїдемо завтра забирати. Maria told us the story of a woman who lived in the village with her two children. Suspicion aroused. A neighbor checked on her, asking what had happened to her kids. To her horror, she noticed there was a hand sticking out of the stove. Asked why she'd eaten her own, the cannibal replied, because they were going to die anyway. <laughs> Вся молодість пішла, бо на куди, і пережили все це те, що нам не треба було, а комуністична система зробила нас найгіршими рабами в світі, і ми залишилися винуваті, не знати тільки за що, за які гріхи, тільки того, що ми були. Звалися українцями. Сорок учнів я мав молодий, але я любив дітей. Любив так, як і своїх дітей. І діти були такі хороші українські, що я вам скажу, вони мені вижаються і зараз, бо вони всі померли з голоду. 
in many of the places where the famine was most devastating, uh, Russians were brought in uh, to replace Ukrainian villagers. In other words, the, the, the nature of the country changed after the famine. What happens in Ukraine, it wouldn't be wrong to see it as a kind of colonization. It was a horrible blow to um, Ukrainian national identity, social solidarity, political trust, um, from which I think it's fair to say Ukrainians are, are still recovering.